Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Meet the Analyst webinar, Digital Video Forecasts and Trends, Streaming Price Hikes, Hollywood Strikes, and more. I'm your host, Paul Verna, Principal Analyst at Insider Intelligence, based in New York, and I'm joined by my colleague, Senior Analyst Ross Benish, who's also in New York and actually in our New York City studio today. Hey, Ross, great to have you. Hey, Paul, good to be here. Before we get into the main presentation, I'd like to thank Stack Adapt for making today's webinar possible. And I'd like to welcome Carly Foy, Director of Sales North America at Stack Adapt. Carly is joining us from beautiful Toronto. Hi, Carly. Hey, Paul. A few things before we dive in. We have a ton of information to share, but there's no need for you to take notes if you'd rather not. We'll email you a link to view the slides and the full recording of today's presentation. But we do want you to participate. So please use the chat window on the right of the video feed to submit questions at any time during the presentation. We'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A at the end of the, of the session. So with that, Ross, let's get started. So we got a lot to cover on the agenda today. And I'm starting out with linear TV ad spending because that's where most TV and video ad spending has been historically. And it's not terribly surprising that we're going to continue to see declines in the amount of money that advertisers are spending on linear television in the US. But I wanna point out that next year we will see a little bit of a bump and that's pretty typical every four years. Um, it happened in 2020 and it happened again in 16. Uh, the Olympics and the elections occur in the same year and they lead to an upswing in TV ad spending. But this bump is, is pretty minor. It's less than uh, one percentage point and it's coming after a nearly double digit decline this year. Now, part of the reason why we don't think the bump next year will be as large as you typically get in this four year cycle is due to um, what's happened with the strikes. So even though the, the strikes are, are set to end, the TV season um, could not be salvaged. Production won't resume until next year. We've already lost the fall season, which contributed to a soft upfront, and we're going to lose the spring season too. So the content quality won't be as high uh, as it usually is, even if viewership is, is more or less stable. You know, you're going to see a lot of reruns, and you're, you're going to see a lot more focus on um, sports and reality programming. Now, in the past, the networks made up for the continual cord cutting that's happened by raising their prices. The bottom line in this chart is TV households, and that's not just uh, traditional, but also virtual uh, pay TV. So that includes stuff like Sling TV and Hulu with Live TV. Even if you include that in your definition of pay TV, you're still seeing a 4 to 5% drop in audience every year. Now, for a while... Uh, those losses were mitigated because you would see double digit increases in CPMs. That did not happen this upfront, according to Media Dynamics. And, and that's going to continue to be a struggle for TV networks because they don't have as much of an audience as they used to have to sell reach against. So when you have a uh, you know, 5% loss in audience every year, you're eventually going to see some pretty significant declines in total ad revenue, like we saw this year. And next year's bump is pretty minor. Now this data just goes a little bit more in depth. It's from LRG and it shows where the losses are happening with, within pay TV. So you know clearly the most losses are happening with cable and then in, in satellite. But in Q2 at least, we at least saw some losses in the VMV PD category. That's stuff like Hulu with live TV and YouTube TV. And so that indicates that these streaming cable services weren't replacing the viewership that had been lost to pay TV like they had in the past when they launched in 2015 and 2016. But this data is somewhat cyclical. Um, you know, we will expect uh, this to flip in Q3 a little bit because of the introduction of NFL programming. And Ross, I understand that LRG is uh, just releasing their updated figures. So I, I, full disclosure, I haven't looked at them yet, but I'm wondering with the loss of subscribers on VMVPDs, and you, you did say that that's cyclical. I had heard that um, Fubo TV reported big numbers, and that actually the dispute between Disney and Spectrum steered more subscribers to VMVPDs because Spectrum was directing them there, 
at a certain point. So any any thoughts on that dynamic? Yeah, so the, the those standoffs did direct more customers toward VMVPDs where like Fubo and YouTube TV were the uh, benefactors. YouTube TV actually just broke 6 million subscribers and, and those numbers did just come out th this morning. So the VMVP category did grow in Q3 and, and you know YouTube TV is where the NFL Sunday ticket is. So they also were seeing that bump as well, which helped them get over 6 million. So, uh, you know, it, it's not like the VMVPD category is declining every single quarter, but the fact that it does uh, leading right up to football is, is concerning because it's a relatively new category that was supposed to replace the fallen viewership from cable. And while it had a good Q3, um, it's just not replacing the, the cable and satellite viewers like it once did. Now, this data is comparing linear TV viewers to ad-supported streaming viewers. The black line is the ad-supported streaming viewers. And when we look at it on a viewer basis, there are significantly more ad-supported streaming viewers than there are paid TV, and that gap is just widening. By the end of our forecast period in 2027, there'll be about double the number of ad-supported uh, streaming viewers as there will be linear TV viewers. But this data um, isn't mutually exclusive because you can pay for Cox or Charter pay TV and also use Peacock or Paramount Plus and be counted in both of these lines. But you do still see a clear divergence in where each is headed. But on a time spent basis, there's still more time spent with TV because if you're going to pay over $100 for your cable package, you're going to use it quite a bit. Whereas, you know, streaming service, someone's paying $10 or less a month. They may only use that for 15, 20 minutes a month. And that's why when we look at it on a time spent basis, linear TV still outranks CTV pretty significantly. Now the gap is closing. Pre-pandemic, there was about two and a half hours more per day per person spent on linear TV than there was on streaming. Now that gap is about an hour per day. So um, you know, streaming is, is still um, gaining ground, but it, it, it's not, you know, the usage isn't anywhere near what we're seeing with linear TV. And as, but as streaming does replace linear TV, I just wanna um, caution advertisers, this is gonna have a significant effect on how much inventory is available because TV was like a, a spray, spray and pray, you know, sort of method where there was just a ton of, a lot of viewing and, and uh, you know, you, you could target a large audience that way, but now uh, streaming is going to have lots minutes per hour of ads, and a lot of streaming is not ad supported. So that's why Madison Wall believes that streaming is less than a fourth of total inventory between CTV and TV, but it's like forty percent of time spent, and that gap is due to the ad loads being smaller. Linear TV is about sixteen minutes of ads per hour. Streaming is typically under ten as well as the um, huge amount that's happening ad-free, like most Netflix viewers. Now, this data just compares what we saw at CTV against other mobile devices, I mean, other digital devices. So although CTV doesn't have the usage that Linear has, it does have more usage than desktop or other connected devices. It is still significantly behind mobile, but we have seen a big jump. Like pre-pandemic 2019, CTV was number three in digital devices. Desktop still generated more viewing. And now its gap on desktop is pretty significant, almost an hour per day more spent on CTV than on desktop. Um, you know, it's not going to catch mobile anytime in the foreseeable future, maybe not ever, but it really has uh, cemented itself as the number two device for viewing and just for general media usage. I wanna switch gears here a little bit and, and talk about um, how streaming services are using their content. And this relates to strikes because it's all about uh, content production and, and cancellation. So Variety looked at how often various streaming services, as well as linear TV, cancel um, you know, a, any of their shows in a given year. And they saw that Netflix was actually right in line with linear TV. About 10% of shows are getting canceled per year. But on the high end, Max was higher than broadcast TV and, and much higher than all the streaming services. And that gives you an um, indication of how they're using content. So since uh, Warner Brothers Discovery merged, a lot of the content on Max is reality-based. 
that's cheap to produce, fairly easy to cancel or, or, or tweak the format on. They're throwing a lot at the wall and canceling quite a bit. They're, they're also, um, the, the company's had some financial struggles, so they've written off some uh, completed shows like they did with Batgirl. So they've seen a, a lot of uh, cancellations. Apple TV Plus is the reverse of that. They are what Max used to be. Uh, they, they're like the, the new HBO, basically. They do very few shows. They're high end. And they only cancel about 5% uh, per year. So, um, you know, th these data points here tell you a lot about the content strategy behind each streaming service. Now, these streaming services, um, even before the strikes, were inching toward profitability. Most of them were losing money, although Netflix was profitable. And their investors have been pressuring them to uh, stop focusing merely on gaining subscribers, but start showing profits. And one of the main ways they've uh, done that is by raising the subscription fees that they charge consumers. And, and this chart was made just a month ago, and there's, there's already been um, a few uh, price increases just in, the, in like the last week. So all these services are, are increasing their prices to get more toward profitability. And those price increases are only going to continue to grow because content has become more expensive. The strikes... Uh, gave actors and writers some concessions. They, they, they won uh, some things in, in their labor negotiations that is going to increase the price of content. So to pay for that, one way to do that is to increase the price of, of the subscription fee. And this is ad-free right here. So this is the cheapest that a consumer can pay well, without stealing someone's password. This is the cheapest a consumer can pay to get an ad-free version of, of any of these select streaming services. Now. In addition to growing revenues, the other effect that increasing prices does is it drives more people to the ad free, I mean, to the ad supported tier because it's cheaper. And Antenna shows that before the pandemic and even during the early stage of pandemic, about one fifth of total streaming signups were ad supported. And now it's more like a fourth. And with Prime Video introducing ads soon, it'll probably get closer to a third. Now, part of the reason that it's jumped is because Disney plus Netflix introduced advertising. They never had it in the past, but uh, it's also jumped because the gap between ad free and ad supported has increased uh, significantly. It used to be like a $5 difference on Hulu. Now it's, you know, a $10 difference. And that's basically across the board, but you see a large variance in how each streaming service um, gets people onto the ad supported plan. At the high end, you have Peacock and Hulu, and I, I'd even throw in uh, Discovery Plus in there, where they get about two-thirds of new signups on ad-supported, but they're often nearly giving away the service for free through some sort of discount or promotion to get them. And that's because they'll profit later through the ad revenue that's generated. So I, I get Peacock. Um, this summer, I signed up for $20 for a whole year. That's Less than two hours a month, they practically gave me that service so that I'd be on the ad supported and generate ad revenue for them. Uh, you know, Hulu ran similar promotions with Spotify. Netflix and Max, which are new to advertising, haven't been as aggressive about pushing their ad tier yet. They only get about a fifth. Um, those numbers will, will probably change, but they only get about a fifth of new signups um, on their ad supported tier because they're they're growing their business and they haven't offered as heavily of discounts. And Russ, to zero in on Netflix for a second, so with about 5% of their total user base on the ad tier, obviously signups, new signups are, are quite a bit more than that. So do you expect that 5-ish percent to, to increase? I do expect it to grow. And in the last few um, quarters, they've reported pretty significant growth. Last quarter, they had a 70% growth. Granted, it's from a small base, but it's a 70% quarter over quarter growth and they're ad supported of uh, viewing and th they're going to continue to grow. So uh, it'll be a long time before the total Netflix audience is 18% ad supported, but it's definitely going to expand beyond that 5%. And, and your question um, actually brings me to my next slide, which is we have a new forecast for ad supported viewers of streaming services. We also have ad free forecasts too. Uh, and that's where you, know, you see that 5%, just, just under 5% of Netflix viewers are ad supported. That last slide was antenna data that was looking at new signups. This is looking at the whole user base of a streaming service. You're seeing 
uh, Peacock, Paramount being three fourths ad supported with, with Netflix at just 5%. Now, Disney Plus has grown their ad supported audience much quicker than Netflix. They launched at basically the, the exact same time, and their share of viewers that are ad supported is triple Netflix's. But Disney Plus has a few things to work with. They have decades experience selling TV advertising, they had an ad sales apparatus ready in place, they weren't building it from scratch. And they control Hulu. Now they actually control all of Hulu. They just bought out the remaining share that Comcast owned. And Hulu is one of the largest players in ad-supported streaming, and, and Disney Plus can lean on them. And there's actually plans to combine Disney Plus and Hulu into a single app. And if once that happens, the ad-supported audience in Disney Plus will only grow to um, become more similar to what you see on Hulu. And these, these figures will also, uh, a, a new addition next year that will um, shake things up is Amazon Prime Video is going to be getting ads and it's going to be the default where they did not have advertising before. Now, aside from raising subscription prices and uh, getting more people to adopt cheaper ad tiers, the other way that streaming services are eking more dollars out of consumers' wallets so that they can achieve profitability is cranking up the ad load. This data is from Media Radar, the middle columns here in this chart. And you can see that the number of ads per minute and all these streaming services increased by double digits um, between the beginning of this year and the middle of this year. On the low end, um, Netflix was about three minutes of ads per hour. Hulu was, was closer to eight minutes of ads per hour. But um, ad loads rarely fall backward. You're probably only going to see ad loads increase. I, I don't think we're going to see 16 minutes of ads per hour like you see on linear networks, but I'd be very surprised if uh, we did this study, if Media Radar did this study a year from now, and Netflix was still at sub three minutes per hour. You know, they'll probably get closer to their peers. But one thing that isn't increasing right now is uh, ad prices. And for several services, such as Disney Plus and Netflix, the ad prices are actually falling. Now, Disney Plus and Netflix launched with pretty high ad prices. That's very common. It, same thing happened with Snapchat Discover and HBO Max. You have a new service. People are seeking exclusivity, share of voice. There's not a lot of inventory. Um, they have few minutes per ad. They have few ads per minute, so they don't have much clutter. They can charge more for the ads that they do have. But then, as the ad business matures and you have more audience and your ad loads grow, the price per unit as that supply increases uh, declines a little bit, and so the gap between what advertisers pay for Netflix and what they paid for Disney Plus is shrinking. It's still above what they're paying for most streaming services, but it's getting more aligned with like the, the median uh, industry figure. Now, these are ballpark estimates. They're from our KPI forecast, which is a, a new forecast that we have. And um, they, they, they're great for directional changes. Um, and they're great for knowing where the industry's at. But a, one given advertiser may look at this and say, well, I pay um, a lot more than $25 for Hulu, or I pay much less. What's the deal with that? And th that's because there are so many factors that can drive your, your ad price, the, the content quality, the, the number of um, targeting parameters you have, whether you're buying straight from the publisher or going through a programmatic intermediary. That's just one of a, a dozen plus variables that will influence the ad price. So um, Netflix ad prices have dropped to you know, $47 CPMs. But um, there's a lot of variance. And Ross, and, any indication yep. of where Amazon might fall on that CPM scale? So I've read some reporting uh, in the trades. Digiday has had some reporting on this, that Amazon was going to be around 30 to $35 CPMs. Um, even though Prime Video is new, they do have a mature business. They've been selling ads for Fire TV and Freebie. So they, they won't get the sky high prices that like Netflix launched with, but they do have the e-commerce component and, and a lot of consumer data that no one else really has access to. And that'll lead to um, a higher premium than what advertisers pay for the average streaming service. And then spe speaking of pricing ranges, uh, that's where you really see pricing ranges with YouTube. So YouTube has lower ad prices than most subscription streaming services. Uh, we're expecting about $15 CPMs. A lot of that's due to the content being primarily user-generated. 
uh, advertisers just don't want to pay as much money to advertise against a, a cat video as they do against um, the, the latest episode of Yellowstone. But YouTube being $15 median, it's not unusual for an advertiser to pay over $30 if they're buying the Sunday NFL package or, or they're buying a NBC show that has an episode or some clips on YouTube. That, that will still be priced like premium television. But a um, video podcast of two guys staring into a camera discussing crypto in their basement, that's probably going to sell for under $10. So the, the $15 um, you know, is just where it is in the middle. It's like if Warren Buffett uh, moved to a small village, everyone in that village is a millionaire, but that doesn't tell you a lot about what in each individual person is making. Now, another trend we're seeing with streaming is that the ad dollars are spreading out. When we did our first forecast in 2019, Hulu, YouTube, Roku were over half the U.S. market. Now they're more like a third. And instead of just having three companies or three services that have a billion dollar business, you now have more than a handful. And Amazon is um, really inching up there pretty quickly. They um, they already were a big player, but but now by putting the ads in Prime Video, that they're climbing up the leaderboard pretty quick, but still be behind Hulu and YouTube. And, and this YouTube figure is, um, this is net ad revenues. For a lot of these streaming services, the difference between net and gross isn't as large, but uh, YouTube effectively pays for its uh, content by doing a revenue share with creator partners who keep 55% of the ad revenue for the videos that they put on YouTube. So on, on a gross basis, YouTube is larger than Hulu, but on a net basis, Hulu is larger. These are net ad dollars here. Now, if we compare streaming revenues with time spent, we get a little bit different picture of the market. So the, the um, vertical axis here is what each streaming services uh, time spent is of the entire market. And that's judged by the Nielsen gauge. And the ad revenue is based on our own forecast. That's the, the horizontal axis. And so, you know, you're reading this chart, which you'll see is YouTube accounts for between one fourth and one fifth of total time spent with CTV, as well as uh, the same amount, roughly the same amount of revenue share. Most of the services that register on the gauge account for less than 5% of streaming time spent, as well as ad revenue. So there's kind of a cluster down there of Disney Plus and Tubi, Peacock, Pluto. They're all about 5% market share. Who's in double digits? They actually lean on advertising a little more than they do on uh, time spent. But the, the big outlier here is Netflix. They have less than 5% of the total ad revenue in this industry, but their usage is similar to YouTube's. They're, they're over 20% of the usage. So you could see here that if Netflix ever... Um, it's a large portion of their viewers that are ad supported and the logo moves closer to that 45 degree line, it, it would shake up the market pretty significantly because they just have so much viewing that these others don't. Even though these others are billion dollar ad businesses, the, the viewing on Netflix is still pretty monumental. Now, Amazon wasn't on that chart, but it may be in years to come. And that's because they are putting ads in Prime Video. And, and that led us to introduce our first ever OTT forecast for Amazon. So this is Amazon streaming ad revenues. There's a, a lot that goes into this. It's um, Freevee, Twitch, Fire TV, Prime Video, uh, anything Amazon. We believed that that business, while still growing pretty significantly, was maturing and, and that um, the sky high uh, growth rates that they had in their early days were, were coming down now that they'd been around a while. That's why the growth dropped from 47% last year to 24% this year. We're expecting a huge year next year, bumping up 85% due to Prime Video inserting ads by default for people. That's going to add nearly $2 billion, not just to Amazon, but, but to the whole um, CTV ad market. Now, uh, it's, it's, not, um, th it's not all of Prime Video that, that's um, going to change. There were portions of Prime Video that were already ad supported, such as the live sports, like the Yankees games or Thursday night football that is on Prime Video. That already had ads sold against it. Freevee was already embedded in Prime Video in a lot of ways. So there was a lot of shows that were available through Freevee, but you could watch them on Prime Video that were, had ads sold against it. And um, 
Amazon video channels, like subscribing to BritBox or Stars through Prime Video still won't have ads. But there is a lot of shows and movies that were on Prime Video on an ad-free basis since the service launched that now are going to have ads unless a consumer takes an action and goes in and pays more to select an ad-free tier. So you know, out, out the gate, you're going to have a very high adoption uh, of the advertising tier. And, and that's going to boost Amazon to become the number three ad seller in streaming, o only really behind YouTube, um, Alphabet, and then um, you know Disney when you combine Disney Plus, ESPN Plus, and Hulu. They're um, shooting up pretty drastically. And this is a move they've been indicating for some time. Oh, and I just want to point out here, that this, this um, revenue is OTT. Um, two slides ago, we had a different figure for Amazon that was CTV. So CTV is a subset of OTT. OTT is all devices. So this is streaming video across mobile, desktop, anything. The CTV is only the TV set. And uh, most streaming about uh, it, it, most streaming still happens on TV sets, so most of this is still covered in the CTV estimate. But this is slightly broader than what I showed before, so the figure is slightly higher. So my main takeaway is just that linear TV is struggling, and the continual odd prices that they the continual price increases that they sought for in the past are going to be tough to get. So you're going to see ad revenue decline, maybe not at the same measurement rate that you see the viewership dropping, which is about 5 6% a year, but the ad revenue is heading downward, and we don't really see that reversing. Now, the viewing is, happening, the viewing is shifting to streaming, and streamers are getting more uh, judicious about profitability. And the way they're doing that is by raising their subscription fees on consumers and then getting more aggressive about advertising, pushing more people to the ad tier and then jamming more ads into the programming once they're there. We are seeing some winnowing in the streaming ad market. So um, it isn't all over the place like it used to be. There will be differences across services for sure, but the differences between uh, what you pay on a top shelf service like Netflix and what you pay maybe on a fast service won't be quite as large as they used to be in the past. And I've hit on this point several times, but I, I do think it's gonna be a pretty big trend next year which is why I don't mind mentioning it three or four times in a presentation. It's just Amazon is going to shake up the market next year. They were already doing a lot of OTT ad selling with Fire TV and Freevee, but with Prime Video getting ads by default and them ramping up their live sports coverage, they're really going to be one of the top companies in streaming advertising next year. And, and that's all I got, Paul. Well, that was great, Ross. Thank you so much. Uh, before we get to your questions live, and we've had some good ones so far, so keep them coming, I'd now like to bring back our special guest, Carly Foy, Director of Sales North America at Stack Adapt. Welcome again, Carly. Thanks, Paul. I'm excited to be here. So let me start with this question. Um, the way, uh, sorry, how how has the way your clients engage with digital video changed? in the last year, are you seeing any interesting trends there? I think there's been a massive uptick in the use of video and advertising campaigns. And I think it's likely due to accessibility in the advertising space. Scale has increasingly become more available over the past five years. And that's actually primarily due to the increase of how consumers have been interacting with video. And we can look to TikTok for that. The rise in popularity of TikTok pushed a majority of major social media platforms, such as Instagram Reels, to adopt a video first strategy, and this has caused a ripple effect throughout the web. Specifically with video, we've seen a rise in the use of 15 second advertisements. This is due to availability, but also an understanding of how consumers behave with the content. And interestingly as well, we've started to see traditional industries such as B2B start to incorporate video advertising into their campaigns. Um, we've also seen a shift also in streaming. I think one thing that Ross had highlighted uh, Tubi and Pluto TV, for example, which are fast or free ad supported streaming television, they're also starting to rise and become a contender in what can be defined as a premium video environment when we're looking at CTV or OTT streaming as well. So in terms of um, your clients and, and how they're integrating or, or how they're navigating the integration of CTV advertising with traditional linear campaigns. What what can you tell us about that? 
And what strategies are you seeing that are proving effective in, in harmonizing these two platforms? For sure. So this is the first year we've seen linear television viewership, according to Nielsen, drop to lower than 50%. It's actually at 49.6%. But at the same time, linear television is actually moving towards programmatic, much like other traditional forms of media due to upgraded hardware. So there's a need in case for having both as an advertiser, but it's about understanding the nuance of why. So with advanced linear television or programmatic linear TV, it's designed to create accessibility for marketers who might not have that higher budget of the traditional upfront TV buys, um, while also still allowing you to act quickly and get real-time results. When we're looking at CTV, we actually are seeing that more leveraged often now for performance marketing, mainly because we can create probabilistic measurements through IP addresses to understand if a user has actually seen an ad on a CTV or an OTT device and gone to the site at a later time. When you're looking for effectiveness in running both, I think the one thing is that we're still very much siloed. So when you're looking at an MVPT, they might not be able to offer additional channels outside of their advanced linear television. So it's important to find a partner that can offer all of the channels. So then you can have create a holistic understanding of your campaigns. But as well, additionally, as the channel continues to grow in popularity, typically we see those other tech partners develop more measurement solutions in-house to be able to measure cross-channel. And with digital video prices declining, how do you or do you anticipate growth in digital video use in the coming year? I think in general, it's going to grow exponentially regardless of the pricing. Um, as Ross mentioned, we continue to see streaming services offer ad-supported tiers, but in addition to that too, Disney Plus is already floating around the idea of password crackdown, which is not great for me, um, but it's really going to help propel, propel the tiered subscription models like it is slowly doing with Netflix as well, meaning more premium inventory will become available. But again, one area that's being overlooked is those fast streamers. They're starting to develop their own content, such as Amazon, Freebies, Jury Duty, which is going to create even more competition in that marketplace. So you're going to have more availability across the board. We also need to remember, as Ross mentioned again, 2024 is a big year in terms of events. We have the Paris Olympics. We also have our political cycle, the U.S. election. Um, so again, I think we're going to see that CTV is likely going to be dominated by those political ads. We're also going to probably see political lean towards adopting the advanced linear television or the programmatic linear uh, side of things due to the ability to be able to content bundle and make sure that you're reaching the right user on a mass scale. Um, but in addition to that, too, also live sports continues to become increasingly popular, and that is becoming, again, more programmatically available to advertisers. As far as the political election year, um, maybe we can trade places and you can hang out in the U.S. and I'll just hide away in Canada because it's it's going to be a doozy. But um, it's me next... anxiety. <laughs> I'm not even living there. <laughs> so the next real question in what ways are emerging technologies like AI and AR slash VR influencing the digital video landscape? And, and are advertisers starting to incorporate these technologies into their strategies? I think they're at a point where we're right now in a work in progress, um, but there is influence when it comes to digital video using AI, for example, and that will be through personalized content delivery. Um, right now, obviously, with the impending Hercules future, what that might look like might be vastly different from what we can imagine right now. So I think we do need to wait and see until what 2024 unfolds. If Google finally phases it out fully by 2024, then maybe we'll have an idea of how that will look like from a personalized standpoint. But we're talking more on the AR side of things. I think advertisers have been adopting that rather quickly in comparison to VR. Um, but AR, again, technically, I feel like it's more on those wall garden inventory sources like Snapchat. Um, one that comes to mind was Snapchat actually created an AR Barbie doll um, that you could actually put your head on a Barbie doll and interact as a character, film a video. A lot of people actually use that across other social media platforms and share that. So it resulted in a lot of earned media in addition to the paid media aspect as well. Um, but again, it's very much a work in progress. With the Hollywood strike as well, we saw that VR was attempting to give facial access to actors after one day's worth of work. Um, obviously, that did not hopefully go through. I don't know for sure. I didn't check the SAG uh, agreement. But that said, we are starting to see more legality come into place as well. So how that's going to move forward, I, I don't know, but we have to stay tuned. 
How are your clients leveraging data and insights to better understand and target their audience and digital video campaigns? And what role does audience segmentation play in this process? So since video is a higher impact unit, we always recommend trying a different approach when it comes to running these units specifically, because you can gain more of a, I guess, larger scale or a wide net, net approach in testing how you can offer your video ad. Um, so we've seen varying degrees of how they implement those solutions, but by being able to test different messaging, we can use creative that can be evocative and it's important to understand the nuances of what will resonate for those ads. So we use those data and insights to be able to drive the creative messaging and then further refine our audiences throughout there. So think emotional ads for an insurance company will likely merit responses from people with families, whereas audience segmentation really comes into play once you've completed the initial tests based on your theories. So the last question, Carly, before we go to live Q&A, how have expectations regarding ROI from digital video campaigns evolved and what are advertisers looking for in terms of measurable outcomes compared to previous years? I think advertisers are starting to see video as outside of just a branding opportunity um, because again, we can use that probabilistic data via CTV or alternatively, we can also use um, impression-based retargeting strategies with video ads. We can infer that a user actually saw an ad and made the simple action, such as going to their website. Doesn't necessarily have to be a conversion point, um, but similar to the audience segmentation, we can also use this data to further the journey. And we're also starting to see CTV publishers like Disney Plus start to test out their own measurement solutions with other tech partners, which was originally prohibited before um, outside of their stack. So we're starting to see that grow uh, exponentially. I think it's going to be a very exciting year to watch. Well, thank you, Carly. And now it's time to get into our audience Q&A. So we've gotten a lot of great questions, and I'm going to start with this one. Uh, and Ross, I'll put you on the spot here. Are these trends similar across different demographics? For example, while total paid TV viewers are declining, are all demographics declining? Are we losing certain segments and retaining others? Well, um, the trends do apply pretty well across demographics. Like linear TV is following, e even among boomers and older viewers, it still is declining um, while CTV is growing with, with everyone. But the rate does vary. So um, with the oldest generation, the rate that they're defecting from pay TV is, is much lower than it is like with millennials or, or Gen X. And um, their CTV adoption is lower. But so that's something that's stood out to me, both in examining our data and and Nielsen's, is is that even with you know people age seventy plus, um, you are seeing a decline in linear TV viewing. Yeah, I mean demographics is a whole topic we could dwell on. Oh, yeah, it's not just time. age, but yeah, yeah. Um, but I also noticed that uh, fast services have a surprisingly older demographic, even though it's a, a streaming platform, but because the content on on those most of those channels is geared toward an older um, viewer, it really mirrors linear TV more than it does streaming. Um, another question for you, Ross, um, a listener asks or a viewer asks, if I have YouTube TV as my supplier and I'm watching my local network programming, as in early or late shows, am I counted as a linear viewer or a streaming viewer? So um, with YouTube TV, you would, even though it, it is streaming, you would be counted as um, a, a linear viewer because most of that viewing happens, most of that advertising is sold by the network. So if you're watching ABC on, on YouTube, um, even though you're getting a digital, you are watching a linear TV package and the, the network um, sells it altogether only two minutes of ads per hour are sold by the provider so like when we break up the advertising um we count the two minutes that like youtube sells as digital and as ctv but the the rest the, the bulk of it is going toward linear Harley, you talked about the strikes earlier so there's a question here how will strikes affect content production next year I mean, it's already impacted it, right? So if we look at Stranger Things, I think it's season five. Full disclosure, I don't watch Stranger Things. I just know it's a very popular show. 
we're looking at 2025 for its air date. So we're probably going to see also CTV behaviors where we are going to see people cancel their subscriptions until that new season arises. So, I mean, there's only so much reality TV we can stream. So at the end of the day, it's definitely going to have an impact in terms of where we are going to see people using specific CTV devices or sorry, CTV streaming services. Another one for you, Carly, since you mentioned political advertising, the viewer is asking, as linear TV viewership declines, do you foresee political ads shifting to CTV and ultimately increasing CPMs similar to how it is now? Yeah, I think we're going to see it more closer to when we actually get that final election uh, time frame. Um, so as we approach November, I think we're going to see a massive rise in CPMs in terms of just competition overall. Um, political advertising, as we know, has a lot of money behind it. So I think once we start hitting around that four week out cycle, we're going to see definitely CPMs increase similar to what we see with holidays. Um, so just be prepared for that. And then just note that you might be a little need, need to be a little bit more agile when it comes to your advertising dollars. Ross, do you anticipate a time when all streaming services will include ads in their subscriber tiers? Yeah, that, that's uh, probably going to happen. The, the main holdout is Apple, um, and there are some um, smaller players. There's hundreds of streaming services, so not every single one of them, but among the top 10, really, a Apple's the main holdout, and I expect them to have an ad tier eventually. It'll probably just wait until they have more audience before they can push it. Um, th there's one other point, though, I just remembered to that question you asked earlier about the VMVPD. Um, now that I thought about it a little longer, we actually have two metrics. So if the listener um, is a pro subscriber, we have total pay TV, which is um, defined as pay TV plus VMVPD, and that includes it. But we also do have, it's just called traditional pay TV that does not include the VMVPD. So it's actually done both ways, depending on um, the subscriber's preference. Right. Uh, another one for you, Ross, about sports streaming. So how is sports changing the streaming ecosystem in your view? Well, it's making some of these uh, services uh, a lot more valuable than they used to be, although it's probably creating some short-term losses for their parent companies. Right now, you're seeing sports coming to um, Peacock and to Max. Like I, I watch the MLB playoffs now on Max. And it's getting to the point, especially it'll be really at that point once ESPN launches their own standalone service that is their linear package and not just ESPN Plus, where um, you can get almost all sports through a streaming service and, and not just through a VMVPD, but through a, a collection of, of streaming services that have various games. So there's a, becoming less uniqueness or um, purposefulness behind the traditional pay TV package as that happens. So here's a question I'd actually like to hear from both of you. With Amazon enabling ad-supported inventory across Prime and effectively opening up incremental supply, do you expect that to put downward pressure on CPMs for other sources of programmatic supply? And I guess ladies first, Carly. I think actually Ross mentioned it best that Amazon has a lot of consumer data. So I think it's actually going to probably remain stagnant in terms of the CPMs overall. Um, it just really depends on how much of a massive uptick we're seeing people flock towards that as an advertising service. Um, but it, the consumer data really makes it a little bit more compelling and it, it allows them to create a higher CPM base for that. So I don't think it's going to create a massive effect but i do believe like disney plus and netflix are starting to see that their cpms are a little too high in my opinion i mean netflix came out pretty bold with theirs uh their overall programmatic strategy was a little bit fragmented so i think they're just trying to catch up right now and and trying to learn from what they know so i don't think prime will have a massive impact on how they approach their cpms but i think amazon will be able to hold true to their cpms mainly just for their data ross any additional thoughts on that um, across the whole market, I, I still think there's enough demand for advertisers who have been seeking inventory um, that the prices won't come down across the whole market. I mean, it makes sense what Carly's saying about Netflix and Disney Plus. Their prices were already coming down because they were um, already pretty high. But uh, some of that data I shared earlier from Madison Wall, um, you know, streaming is still just 25% or less of total inventory, even though it's 40% of time spent. 
um, th there's so many fewer minutes in streaming that, that are ad supported compared to linear that even with the in introduction of Amazon, um, I want to say there's a shortage of inventory, but I, I still think there's enough demand to meet that inventory that you wouldn't see like a industry-wide uh, price decline, but it's a good question. So we have time for one more question, and I, I also like to hear from both of you, and I'll start with you, Ross. And, and admittedly, this is a very open-ended question, so take it any way uh, you want, but any insight or point of view on any of the merger talk for 2024? Well, I, that, that, I feel like that comes up every year. Um, you know, we just saw Hulu um, be fully overtaken by Disney. That, that had been in the process for a while, but uh, I know there's been rumors of Comcast buying various assets. As the streaming services exist right now, the, the company that seems most um, in um, the best, not in the best position, but in, in the most um, uh, desirable way to to do some sort of different division of their business would be Warner Brothers of Discovery, um, especially when they keep um, chopping content down. Um, or, you know, are they looking to sell off a part of that? You know, they, they Warner Brothers Discovery, when they put their sports on Max, they called it Bleacher Report. They didn't call it TNT Sports or TBS Sports, which I would think has a lot more brand equity than Bleacher Report, which uh, most people in the country probably don't know what that is, unless if they're um, young or digitally savvy. Um, you know, that might be reading the tea leaves too much, but maybe that makes me feel they would sell part of their company, perhaps um, some of the assets related to uh, linear. Carly, any thoughts from you on this? Yeah, I think the consolidation across the board, it, it, to Ross's point, it comes up every year. So it's inevitable that we're going to see it. Whatever properties change over, change hands, there's there's going to be a benefit and a drawback in the market. So realistically, just keeping an eye on that and making sure that we we can understand where the brand equity is going and the impact on the overall advertisers' campaigns. I, I think regardless of the merger talks, we're always going to have consolidation. So uh, just always be prepared for it and, and again, be agile. Yeah, and I'll throw my own pebble into this pond here. There's been a lot of talk about Disney because they're clearly preparing to sell their linear TV assets or they, they've signaled that that's something they will do. And with them buying the part of Hulu they don't already own, they're they're definitely leaning into the streaming business, but it has raised questions about whether Disney, the whole company will be for sale, whether they're trying to sort of make their balance sheet look attractive to a buyer. So I think that's a rumor that's gone around a bit and I'm sure we're gonna hear more about it in, in 2024, but that will be a topic for another time for today. That's all the time we have. Uh, so thank you again, Ross, for joining us and a very special thanks to Carly and to the team at Stack Adapt, our II Studio crew and the eMarketer production team also deserve a huge thank you for making the webinar possible. As promised, we'll be emailing you a link to today's slides along with a full recording of the session. So keep an eye out for that. And before we wrap up, let me just take a moment to tell you what's happening across eMarketer's media channels. You can register for more live analyst and tech talk webinars on our events page at emarketer.com slash events. On the audio side of the house, don't forget to tune in to Behind the Numbers, eMarketer's daily podcast. And finally, please check out our newsletters. Thank you again for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your workday.